what I want to do tonight is to show you how we can actually understand how a brain, uh, how the brain works. And to do that, I'm going to talk about bugs. So, like I said, I'm interested in how I work. So why am I talking about bugs? It's not because I have a cynical view of humanity. It's because we can actually learn quite a bit about how we work by understanding how they work. So, by my flippant title, really what I meant is how the brain works. What's special about the brain? The brain is made up of just a bunch of cells, right? And these cells aren't actually that different from the cells that are in your kidney. They're made up of mostly the same parts. So it's not the cells per se that make the brain special. It's the interaction, oops, it's the interaction between them. So what, uh, what really makes the brain do uh, all these amazing things is the interactions. When we zoom out, we see that the brain is this complicated network. And what the task that we, have to, uh, that we have at hand is to understand this complicated network. Who's talking to who? What's going on? It's actually not unlike understanding a social network. The questions are, on some level, fundamentally similar. Or even how a school of fish navigates. The first thing you might want to know is who's talking to who? Or if they are talking to each other, what, <laughs> what are they saying, right? Those are the kind of things that you would want to know. All right, so what makes the brain actually a hard problem? It's the interaction between them. And because the brain has so many cells, so many interactions, it's a fundamentally difficult network to try to understand, which is why I study flies. So at this point, you might want to know, I, OK, fine, so the brain is hard, but is studying the fly brain actually going to tell us anything about our brain? Well, we're in luck, actually. So here's an example. What I'm showing you on the right is a schematic of the, uh, the network, if you will, of how information gets from your nose into your brain. And what I'm showing you on the left is basically the same thing in a fly. How uh, odor information gets from the fly's antenna into its brain. Now, this is just a schematic, so right, it, they're the same. But aside from the fact that the numbers are different, right? we have more cells than they do, there's a remarkable similarity between how odor information gets from the nose in our brain and how the same thing happens in flies. Right, but flies don't have noses. <laughs> so the, fa the, the fact that this is similar should, is kind of remarkable, right? It says that there's some deeper, maybe even organizing principle for why, uh, why you would want to build a, a network this way. Now, I don't want to mislead you. I'm not saying that our brains are flies' brains, at least for most of us. Um, <laughs> there are certainly differences. The visual system, for example, is actually uh, quite different to the extent that we understand it. But the fact that there are these remarkable similarities tells us that there is, there's hope. There's a possibility that understanding a fly brain might really teach us something deeply meaningful and, uh, and informative about how we work. So
So let's come back to flies. To be clear, I'm talking about the little guys, right? Not even house flies, They're really little. So there are a couple reasons that flies are useful. First of all, they're small. We can actually do things to them and see their whole, their whole brain. So it, here's an example of something a fly can do. Flies are not very smart, but they can actually learn things. Uh, so what you're going to see is there are two flies in an arena. And it's a male fly and a female fly. The male fly is trying to court the female fly. But unfortunately for him, the experimenters have something else in mind. And every time he gets too close, he gets zapped by a, a laser. It, it's kind of mean, I know. <laughs> All right, you see the male fly approaching the female. He gets zapped, he backs up, the laser hurts. I know. Yeah. After a while, he's figured out that she's bad news, so he keeps his distance. Now, the problem is, she was actually, yeah, she was actually kind of into him. So she comes over and says, where'd you go? What, what's going on? Here, maybe I'll, does everybody see that? You want me to, I'm going to play it again. Oops, sorry. I'm having computer trouble tonight. I'm going to play that again just so you can see. The, basically, he's learned that if I get too close to her, it's going to hurt. So I'm going to keep my distance. And you know, you can feel free to anthropomorphize as you want. But, um, and uh, the, the authors of this study cleverly called it the restraining order assay. Um, I realize I'm standing in front of uh, the, the citation if people actually want to go look at this. So you, you get the idea. Like this is learning. The, the male fly has learned that, uh, that he should keep his distance. So you know, this is a silly example. But the cool thing is that we actually know quite a bit about how this works. So uh, here's, it's a little bit washed out, but uh, this is a fly brain in purple. This is the whole thing. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's about a or half a millimeter across. It's small, right? And the structure that I'm showing you here in green is called the mushroom body. It's a crucial uh, part of the circuit for flies to be able to learn. In fact, uh, if you kill these cells, flies can't learn. Just nothing. Can't learn at all. Now, uh, just to kind of zoom in and give you a sense, first of all, why it's called a mushroom body. You can see it looks vaguely like a mushroom here in yellow. You can also see the, the cells that, uh, that provide input to it. But I just want to point out also that it's probably fortunate that the people that discovered it were inspired by uh, a mushroom and not <laughs> other things that it sort of lo lo looks a bit like. So. All right, um, so, so learning. Um, here's another example of a case where a part of a fly brain actually looks quite a bit like our brain. So here now I'm showing you a schematic of the mushroom body with surrounding like what, what uh, its inputs and outputs are. Uh, and that's on the left. On the right is a schematic of our cerebellum. It's right back here, right? It's the part of our brain that's important for learning to ride a bike. So you know, we have other parts of the brain that are, that are crucial for learning. But the fly doesn't. The fly essentially is, is a walking cerebellum. So you know, first of all, that tells you something about why a fly may be limited in what it can learn. But also tells you that studying how flies learn could potentially tell you a lot about how we learn. So I'm going to come back to learning in a minute. Uh, but first, we need to take a brief digression into, uh, into tricks, essentially. How we can actually manipulate things to figure out how the fly brain works. 
a dirty swimming pool. So the first trick that's really useful to understanding how fly works is called optogenetics. Some people may have heard of it. The idea is that algae make uh, a protein that's light sensitive. It's, uh, it takes, it turns light into currents inside the cell and it's how they actually phototax to, to find light for photosynthesis. And uh, it's, it's a very similar actually to the proteins that are in our eyes that allow us to see. Now why am I telling you about algae? It's because we can play genetic tricks. We can take the gene from the algae and put it in the right place in, in a, fly, uh, a fly genome. And if we're clever about it, we can essentially make the cells of our choosing become light sensitive. So we can make random cells, or actually quite specific cells, in the fly brain light sensitive. And otherwise, you know, they're in the middle of the brain. What business do they have being light sensitive? But that's useful, because that means that now we can come along and activate the cells of our choosing with light. All right, so here's an example. Here's a fly running around, and every time the light comes on, she has no choice but to run backwards. Now, flies don't normally run backwards. They actually, uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a fly voluntarily run backwards. But she has no choice. Essentially, we're, we're activating some part of the, the, the brain that triggers this response. I should say the fly actually can't see the light. You can see the light. But this is the result of activating specific cells in her brain that, that cause this behavior. Now, this is sort of a silly example. This is actually a, an experiment that I did by accident. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking, actually. Um, so uh, let, let's be a little bit more serious. Let's come back to, to learning. So we want to use this trick to understand how flies learn. Well, if we come along here and activate the cells that would normally be activated by an odor and essentially uh, do so at the intersection, if you will, of where odor information would meet information about things that are innately good or bad in the world, say food or electric shock. This is the circuit that allows a fly to, to learn that association or to learn that, uh, that the female fly that he was trying to court is bad news. So we can now activate these cells and, uh, and pair that activation with shock and essentially teach a fly that the smell of light is bad. So think about that for a second, right? <laughs> so I'll show you an example of that. So now we're going to look at multiple flies. Uh, they're a little harder to see, so you've got a, a green circle around each one. These are flies that have been trained that the smell of a red light is bad. And you're going to see the red light come on uh, on the left. And all the flies run to the right. They've learned that it's bad news, but they can't see the light. They smell the light. <laughs> all right. So, let's move on to another trick. The, uh, essentially, you know, what you want to do to be able to understand how the brain works, it's useful to be able to touch stuff, but you also want to be able to actually see what's going on. So we're going to play another trick. This time, instead of borrowing from algae, we're going to borrow from jellyfish. So jellyfish have the ability to glow. We can now take that gene that makes a jellyfish glow and link that to a reporter of activity in the brain so that when a cell is active, it glows. So uh, in collaboration with some engineers that built a microscope to let us 
see the whole brain of a fly. And, and also this manipulation so that we can see activity. We, get, we can get data that look like this. So what you're looking at is an entire fly brain rotating just so you can see what's going on. Each little dot is a cell. And here it's just glowing because it has this, this protein in it. We'll, I'll show you activity in a second. But what I want you to appreciate is that we can see the actual cells in the whole brain. And with the, these microscopy tricks, we can do this 10 times a second. And in an animal that's actually doing something. So what, uh, what can the animal do, right? We can't let it run around. It's got to stay under the microscope. Um, so instead of letting it actually run around, we let it think it's running around. <laughs> So this is exactly what it looks like. This is a fly running on a giant, or giant from its perspective, actually quite small, uh, treadmill. <laughs> it's a tiny styrofoam ball suspended in air so that it's essentially frictionless, so that the fly can actually move it. So the fly thinks it's going, I don't know what, what the fly thinks. The fly thinks it's going somewhere, right? And. Uh, and we can present stimuli to it, right? We could uh, present a visual stimulus. We could puff some motors at it. Essentially, it's fly virtual reality. And so uh, with, uh, with all of this uh, setup, we can essentially create a virtual world and then just watch what, what is the fly thinking, essentially. All right, so what is the fly thinking? Here's an example of what's going on in the fly brain when it's running and we puff an odor at it. So to orient you, each time something flashes, that's active cells, right? And the little, the, the little guys are, are cells, the, the big clumps are actually the interaction between cells. It's clumps of synapses. So you see the big flash, that's when the odor comes on. And there's lots of other stuff going on too, right? So you know, we can start to, to literally see what, what the fly is thinking, if you will. All right. So here's my last example. Now uh, we're just going to let the fly run and, and see what lights up. It's a little bit more processed. So now you see uh, each time uh, each time a cell is active, you see some stuff uh, light up, you see some big stuff, some small stuff, right? And uh, here we go. Let's let it go for a while. Basically, the, there's a lot going on, right? The, there's uh, a lot of activity in this very you know, complex patterns as, as the fly is, is, uh, is running. So, so I'll leave you with that. Uh, I think that uh, we are on the path to understanding how we work, essentially. Um, and that path starts with bugs. Thanks. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.